This here is my latest project that I'll be working on. It is an original pen line GG1 made back in the 50s. Now it looks pretty bad. It doesn't work at the moment, but I think this may be a case of it looks worse than it actually is. So I'll just give you a brief history of the model and then we'll get right to fixing this thing. The history of Penline's GG1 is relatively short. There's not much information available on these, but I was able to gather a decent amount of information from TCA Western, HO Seeker, and Tony Cook's Trains Resource. So Penline started making the GG1 in 1956, and at that time it was a very expensive kit priced at $49.50, which converted to today's dollars is $450. It would only be a couple of years, though, before they lowered the price to less than half of what it was, and by its final year in 1962, it was only $21.95 for the kit. Shortly after this, Penline would go out of business. The molds for the GG1 were sold to Varney, which was then acquired by Lifelike, and for a very short time, the GG1 was sold under the Varney name and then the Lifelike name. By the time Lifelike finished selling it in the early 70s, the kit was $24.98, or you could get it ready to run for $34.98, which was still quite a bit less expensive than its original price in the late 50s. By this time, Riverasi had brought out their scale-sized GG1 in 1969, which was imported by AHM, and although it was made of plastic and didn't have the power of the pinline model, it was quite a bit more detailed, and because of the scale size, I assumed that everyone started to look towards this one instead of the older Pinline model. So the Pinline, Varney, Lifelike GG1 went out of production, and I believe after this the molds for it went to Bowser, who did have some bodies and other parts in stock for a while, but at this point the molds have all been scrapped. Alright, so as it is now, none of the trucks are actually held into the body, so I'll just lift that right off of there. The wires aren't connected either, except for that one right there, so I'll just uh, undo that with the soldering iron and we'll start by repairing the motor truck here, which it does look like is mostly complete, so I don't think this will take too much work to get going again. There's the main motor truck on its own. All I did was touch that with the soldering iron real quick and it came right apart, so that was easy enough. So before I power on the motor, I'm going to start by taking it out, and to remove it, I have to actually disassemble the truck. So that's just held together by these four screws from the look of it. At least the bottom plate here. There it goes. Yeah, looks like it's also held together by the side frames. Small screws on there. I think I only have to take out these two, though. Yeah, there it goes. Oh, no washer fell out. I wonder where it's, what that goes to, or if it goes to anything. worm shaft and I'll have to disassemble the truck the rest of the way to get that out because of that last axle inside I'll have to take this side frame off at least there we go more washers there. I guess that was to give us some insulation. I'll figure that out later to be sure, of course. Alright, now the worm shaft comes out. That's kind of interesting. They made it a full-length worm instead of putting individual ones onto a single shaft like most manufacturers do. And now I can get to the motor screws in here. Oops. That's not wanting to 
grip it very well. There we go. So they're kind of tight. There it goes. And this is the plate that holds the truck in. I might still be able to use that if I put some washers over the screws. But now we're down to the motor. Let's see how this does. Clip there and clip there. And it works just fine. Just needs a bit of oil and a quick tune-up. I like using a little wire here to put the oil in, especially in these tight spaces. It's very useful. Get that right in there between the washer and the bearing. Another drop in the front. And the commutator doesn't really look bad at all, so I think I'll leave that alone this time. Just let the brushes clean it off. Oh yeah, that sounds better already. And it only draws about a quarter of an amp. Not bad at all for one of these old open frame motors. I might just clean that up a little more, but beyond that, is it really, this motor really doesn't need any maintenance. So let's go on to the rest of this. The wheels have quite a bit of old dried up grease in there, so I'm gonna have to give them a good cleaning. But yeah, overall, this really doesn't look like it's in bad shape at all. It just mostly looks bad and has a slight amount of damage here and there. I'm going to clean up the worm shaft here. I'm just wiping that down with a paper towel. That seems to be enough to take out what's needed. And I can use my nail there and kind of push that down into the worm slots to help get out some of the inside grease. That seems to be working well so far. That's looking nice and clean. Those uh, bushings are also spinning freely on there already, so all they'll need is a little bit of fresh oil. So I'll just clear out the large gear the rest of the way using the stiff brush here. There honestly isn't much in there either, so this is going really well so far. And I think that's good enough. So now, I'll move on to the wheels here. They've got a little bit, a little bit more crusty grease on them, so I'll start by wiping some of that down with the paper towel as much as I can anyway. It's coming off easily enough. Now I was finding it kind of difficult to reach everything I needed, so I'll just uh, disassemble this axle using my Northwest Short Line pulling tool. That's assembled pretty tightly. Not that that's a bad thing. There we go. And now I can get to things a little more easily. As long as I've got the axles disassembled, I'm going to go ahead and give the wheels a good cleaning and buffing. Well, I think that turned out pretty good. Let's do that for the rest of them. And for cleaning up the insides of the trucks, 
the Q-tip is very useful. You just uh, go around in all those different slots there, wiping up the crud. And that's already looking pretty good. All right, I've got those wheels cleaned up. I oiled all the bearings and added a bit of grease to the gears. So let's see how this works. Well, everything seems to be smooth, but that is really noisy. I'll add a little bit of grease to those uh, tower gears there. Maybe that'll help to quiet things down. Those are exactly the same size though, so I'm going to have to add grease all the way around instead of just letting it work through slowly. That seems to be working pretty well. It does seem like neither of these tower gears is 100% perfectly um, centered, so I might be able to do a little bit of uh, counter uh, alignment to get them to be a little quieter and smoother. All right, so I've got all the wheels cleaned up, all the gears cleared out and re-greased with some fresh stuff. Also buffed the contact there. This is for when you want to switch between track power and pantograph power. So flip it that way to cut off the track power so then it collects from the pantographs. So I also found out this part here. I was wondering what this was. Uh, I guess this is, they call it a rectifier in the manual. So it's basically an early diode. And the universal between the trucks was missing from this one. Unfortunately, the large size universals from Northwest Shortline are an exact perfect fit for these, so those just slip right in. There's no wobble or anything. So if you have one of these and the shaft is missing, you know where to get a new one. So now I'll just uh, reconnect a few wires and see how this thing runs. So I went to give it a quick track test there and got nothing at all. So. I found out that the wire that was originally soldered to the truck there had some internal fractures and was no longer conducting, so I replaced that with a new wire. And now, seems to be all good. Seems to be working pretty smoothly so far. And that honestly didn't take as much maintenance as I expected, mostly just the in addition to the replacement wire, just the cleaning, fresh oil and grease, and that new universal, and off it went. So for further testing, I've put the body and trucks back on. As you can see, though, I've removed pretty much all the parts from the body, including the weights inside, so it's not quite as heavy as it's going to be, but I think it'll still work well for giving it a good test, so let's see how it does. A pretty smooth start. This thing is noisy though. Oh, I just now noticed the truck derailed, so I better take care of that. And the rear truck didn't exactly hold together, so I guess I'll have to take care of that. All right, I fixed the truck with just a bit of glue, and that has now been running constantly for about an hour with absolutely no problems. Seems to be very smooth too, which is nice. It's just really noisy is all, so I might give that a little upgrade eventually. One other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace the motor's magnet because it seems to have lost basically all of its torque. I was curious about just how much noise was coming through these two tower gears here. So I decided to make a couple of pulleys there and attach a belt. And it made a really big difference in the amount of noise. The trucks still have some gear noise of their own, but this is a huge improvement. still 
nowhere even close to being a silent runner, but that belt drive really did make a difference. It's running pretty well. Since I've got it running pretty well now, I decided the next thing to do is strip off all the old paint and get to repainting this thing. I'm not exactly sure what kind of paint was used on there because the lacquer thinner that I normally use to clean all these things up didn't even make a dent in it. So I ended up cleaning up the whole thing using a wire wheel, which is not my favorite thing to do. I'm sure there's some sort of a solvent that would have worked on that paint, but I don't have anything else on hand to try. Wire wheel worked though, even if it was time consuming and I did it outside to make sure I wouldn't be making too much of a mess in here. So since I already have a GG1 from IHC and the Pennsylvania red with a single stripe, I thought it'd be nice to do a different paint scheme on this one. So I'm going to be doing it in the uh, Pennsylvania Brunswick green with five stripes. I think that'll look pretty good. To upgrade the torque of the motor, I purchased this 5 8 inch neodymium cube. This is the most powerful magnet I have ever purchased for anything, so let's see what it does in here. So just before we start, power up the motor with the old magnet one more time. It's 12 volts. It's only using about a quarter of an amp there. It doesn't really take too much to stall it. To change out the magnet, all I've got to do is remove this large screw in the back. I can get a good grip there. Looks like someone tried to solder something to the screw before. Yeah, that's gonna take some work. Got that solder ground out of the slot and now the thing is moving. Pull that out. Now, to figure out the polarity for this one, I'll just uh, put my finger between there. Oops, <laughs> that's really powerful. I'm actually reversing the direction of this motor for the, for the belt drive, so I will flip that over to the opposite polarity. Carefully snap this on in. It looks like there's a bit of a gap between that and the plates, so I'll have to stick something in there to make up for that. I just happened to have some very thin magnets on hand that were exactly the thickness I needed. So that's got everything all seated now, right where it's supposed to be. No more screw going through there, but the magnet's strong enough that it doesn't even know, need it to hold together. There is a noticeable drop in speed, and it's also dropped about 20% um, off of the current draw. So let's see how that does actually running the thing. It seems to be running good and strong. For actual running, there's only been a very slight decrease in speed, which means that the amount of torque that the motor had before was just barely enough to drive the thing. So I'd say that was a definite improvement. And you may not have noticed, but I've started the process of painting this thing too. So as I mentioned in the last clip, I've gotten started on the whole painting and lettering process. I sprayed this in the Pennsylvania Brunswick Green. You can see some imperfection around there. That's just the uh, metal itself causing that, not the paint being rough. So. That'll still look pretty good under most light though. You won't really see most of that. As for the lettering and stripes, I've got that all done on one side. I think that turned out really well. Used micro scale decals for the lower pinstripe here. I actually cut one of these large five stripe sets into individual pieces and put that together. Now because this is a short body, the Pennsylvania um, lettering there. The one provided with the decal set was made for a scale size GG1 so it was too long for this so I actually had to cut that up and place the letters individually which took quite a bit of time but I think that turned out really well. So 
I've just got one side to go for the decals, which will take a little while because you have to take a lot of care in doing this. And for setting them down, I am using the Microsol setting solution. I actually previously used my usual Walther's Solva set, but it turned out to be too strong for these decals. And they kind of looked like that by the time it was all done. So I had to completely strip this down and repaint it, which was unfortunate, but at least it's all turning out well now. I'm also putting the little emblems and numbers onto the end pieces here on the doors. Again, because these are undersized, the decals don't fit quite perfectly, but with the setting solution, that should still look pretty good in the end. And one last thing I'm doing is I'm working on creating the handrails in the same shape and size as would have been provided with the kit originally. These were all missing, so that's why I'm having to make my own, but they're turning out well. This piece here fits into a slot and kind of doubles as a step detail while these fit into the pre-drilled holes. Now, since one of the pilots is missing, I um, took some detailed measurements off of the one that is there and made a 3D model. And we'll see how that prints out. Hopefully it'll look at least close to being as good as the original. All right, the print's done. And it may not be perfect, but I think that turned out pretty well overall. Just needs a little bit of cleanup here and there, a couple little wire details added to help it match the original pilot better, and I think it'll be hard to tell that that was ever a replacement part unless you look closely. I'm just about done here. I've got left to do is a final clear coat on some of the larger chassis parts, and then for the, some of these other parts, I'm just brush painting them and then also clear coating them with a brush. And on the front and rear trucks, I've replaced the original plastic wheels with some metal ones. These came off of an IHC steam engine that I gave a little upgrade a while ago, but they're still good wheels and I think will match well to the originals. So that's turning out nicely. I'm also working on the uh, pantographs here. You can see the first one here is just about finished. I've just got to brush a little bit of clear coat on there. I cleaned up this whole part with a wire wheel to get rid of all the tarnish. I don't know if I'll leave that bare or clear. Of course, if I leave it bare, it could tarnish again, and I don't really use overhead power anyway. But I also might just leave it alone. Well, I'll decide that later. Just one left to go on these pantographs. I just have to unbend a couple spots here and there to make it work smoothly and look as good as possible take off that tarnish there, and then brush paint it. Well, things are starting to come together now. I've got this front truck reassembled. Things seem to be working pretty well. I've got truck clearance there. Once I'm sure everything is working 100% perfect, I'll paint all these screw heads to match the rest of it. And now I just have to get the motor truck back together and I can get to reassembling and testing this thing. Got things wired up the way they showed in the instructions. So now we'll see if that works for the lighting and if that um, rectifier doesn't work anymore, I'll just replace it with a couple diodes. All right, the assembly's mostly finished. It's kind of a pain to put this one together, so I hope I don't have to take it back apart. But let's go test it out and see how it does. And off it, oh man. Well, it started off looking pretty good, and then a short circuit happened, so let's see where that's coming from. Okay, so I think a couple of these insulated wheels were touching the inside of the metal side frame, so I added a bit of masking tape in there, and we'll see if that fixes the short. All right, so it seems like I finally got that short circuit figured out. This has been running around for a while now with no problems at all. It took a while to find what was going on exactly. It was a 
really, really, really hard to see. But what I found was that that middle wheel there, that's an insulated one, the flange on it was just barely contacting that point where the side frame mounts to the truck. So I filed down that part of the side frame a bit on the inside where you can't even see it. And it's been working great ever since. So now I can get on to touching up a couple spots and putting this back together. Just getting this last pantograph in place now. Interesting thing I found about these. They're actually only held on by two screws, even though there are four total. So the other two screws, all they do is uh, hold those two little plastic posts in place. And then they just have tabs that press into the holes. I'll just push this back down, get it locked into place. And instead of snapping it down, you actually want to move this little lever down here. You can kind of see that bit moving there. This way you don't damage any of the metal parts. And with that, the Penline GG1 is all finished and ready to run. And now as long as we're here, I want to go ahead and do a quick review of the model. So, like pretty much all of Penline's models, aside from their F units, this one is made completely out of metal, as you could obviously see while I was fixing it up. Most of their kits around the time actually used a solid lead body and chassis, but this one uses the uses zinc diecast instead, with the only lead being the weights inside of the body, which give it some good heft on top of what it already had. So it's a really, really solidly built model. I feel like this one really does a good job of capturing the overall shape and appearance and most of the details of the real GG1s, which overall was a pretty smooth, simple design, so there wasn't much detail to actually um, replicate on these. Mostly just some ventilation, like you can see down there, and then grab rails and a few other parts like the pantographs. Penline's truck design keeps the side frames and the pilots rigid to the rest of the trucks, and that there is the reason why they ended up scaling this down to make it a short model instead of scale-sized. And when you put it next to a scale-sized model like the IHC one I have here, the difference in scale really does become very apparent. So the Penline model really is very short and out of scale. Even with that, though, it does capture the appearance of the GG1 very well, so when it's on its own, the size difference isn't quite so noticeable. It's just uh, when you're putting it next to a scale size model that it really does look very short. As for the paint and decoration, you could get it in the Pennsylvania Red or a few other railroads, and the paint for its time was pretty good, I would say. Some of the lines, like on the stripe, were a bit fuzzy. Some of the lettering wasn't quite perfect, which is to be expected on most models of this age. I painted this one to represent the number 4877 as it appears today. And I used microscale decals for that. I'd say it all turned out very well. So with modern paint, this does look very, very good. But it also looks pretty good with the old paint. The running quality of this model really is very good. It is noisy, but it's extremely powerful. It has pretty nice speed control too. The original um, tower gearing was definitely noisy. That's why I changed it out for the belt drive like you saw before. Even with the belt drive, it's still a noisy model. But very smooth running. some minor electrical pickup issues which can be improved later by maybe adding some wipers to the insulated wheels and wiring those in. And here we've got it running at full speed. I've measured that to be about 110 scale miles per hour. So that's not bad at all for a GG1.
I also decided to clear coat the tops of the pantographs since I'm not using any wires. I can just scrape that off later if I ever want to. So I'd say this is overall a very nice example of an early model of an electric locomotive for the American market. They were very expensive for their day, but they were also very complicated. You get a lot of metal there and a nice running model, so back then I'm sure they were worth the price just as much as some of the really high quality models from, say, Broadway Limited are now. So at the time you really couldn't get any better than this.